This is John Immervar. Today we're going to visit the Rodin Museum, a satellite of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, just down the parkway next to the Barnes Foundation. This jewel box of a museum is dedicated to the sculpture of Auguste Rodin. Of course, you'll want to go into the museum, but some of the most iconic Rodin sculptures are in the museum's beautiful garden, which is always open. So you can see these works anytime, even like today during a pandemic when the museum is closed. When you come to the museum, the first thing you'll see is this gate with several sculptures, including Rodin's most famous sculpture, The Thinker. You might be asking, why do we have a museum dedicated just to Rodin? To answer that, I'll contrast The Thinker with another statue done almost at the same time by another French sculptor. You might recognize it. Lady Liberty. She's Libertas, a Roman goddess of liberty, and the spikes around her head are like a halo, indicating her divinity. Her face is classic, noble, unmoving. Her torch illuminates the path to liberty, and she carries a tablet with the date of the Declaration of Independence. In case you missed the theme of liberty, she has broken bondage chains at her feet. It's a great statue, but it isn't subtle. It's noble, classic, and makes a single powerful statement. Now, let's look at the thinker. He isn't a Roman god or a military hero. He has no identifying clothing or marks at all. His hands are the hands of a working man. He has massive muscles, but he didn't get them from working out at a gym. He's every man, and everything here is dynamic. His toes are clenched as though he's about to jump up. If you're sitting down, try this. Put your right elbow on your left thigh. It's an awkward pose, like a coiled spring. And he's searching. Maybe he's looking for an answer, or maybe he's still looking for the question. Compared to Lady Liberty, he is not static, but restless. Not a goddess, but a worker. This statue is not a statement, but an unsettling question. That's the genius of Rodin. Now, here's another question. We have a thinker in Philadelphia, and there's another one in Paris at the Rodin Museum there, and several others around the world. So is the Philadelphia thinker a real Rodin, or just a copy? It's a real Rodin, but to understand that, we have to recognize that there are two main ways to make sculptures. Some sculptures are made by carvers. They work with stone, like marble, and use chisels to carve into the stone, like Michelangelo. And the piece that the artist carves is the original, and anything else is a copy. But if you look around Philadelphia, most of the statues are made of metal, like Joan of Arc here. And they're not made by an artist, but cast in a foundry by metal workers. These metal statues are usually made by modelers, who build up a sculpture from clay. The details are really complicated, but here's a very general idea of what happens to turn a clay model into a metal sculpture. Using molds, skilled artisans turn the clay original into a plaster of Paris replica. In the process, the original clay model that the artist actually touched is destroyed. From the plaster of Paris version, metal workers make molds to cast a bronze version of the statue. But the plaster of Paris is not destroyed in the process, so additional bronze versions can be made. But only a very limited number of authorized Rodin sculptures, using the same complex process of casting, are allowed to be made. So the Paris version and the Philadelphia version are both authorized Rodins, even though the Philadelphia version was cast after Rodin's death. They're like two prints made from the same negative. Now, we'll see how Rodin used the ability to make multiple versions in a very creative way. For example, next to the thinker, in a niche on the gate, is a sculpture sometimes called The Shade. He's a heavily muscled man like the thinker, and notice that his body is posed like a classical ancient or renaissance statue in what's called contrapposto, with one knee bent and the other straight. But breaking dramatically with classical tradition, Rodin has slanted the head to the side in a physically impossible posture, 
as though he's carrying a heavy burden that is literally crushing him. Another name for this figure is the slave, which relates well to the idea of a massive burden. Rodin often makes his figures anatomically exaggerated to heighten their effect. Now, keeping that figure in mind, walk toward the museum itself and go around to the left side and you'll see this remarkable grouping. As you look at it in more detail, you'll see how Rodin created it. He put together three identical versions of the shade to make a group known as the Three Shades. Assembling multiple works to make a new grouping is a technique that Rodin uses frequently to great effect, as you see here. With the three shades together, the sculpture takes on a new meaning. In addition to suggesting a crushing burden, it evokes the idea of solidarity, and the three arms form a dramatic downward arrow, as though pointing to something below. Now, let's see how the sculpture of three shades evolved. Walk back to the entrance of the museum and walk up the steps to see Rodin's famous Gates of Hell. Rodin worked on it for almost 40 years. He called it his Noah's Ark, since many of his most important pieces started out as smaller versions on the gates. For example, at the top you'll see a smaller version of the Three Shades. Now their downward pointing arms focus our attention on what's going on below. Immediately below the Three Shades is a smaller version of the Thinker, now understood as the poet Dante, who created through his thought the vision of hell that we'll see below. Look around. There are over 200 figures. These panels are a whole museum in themselves, and many of Rodin's larger statues are based on the smaller figures you see before you. For our last work, go down the stairs and cross to the other side of the museum, to see the Burgers of Calais, a work commissioned by the French town of Calais to celebrate a famous moment in the town's history. There's a story here. In 1347, the town was besieged by English forces. The citizens were starving and wanted to surrender. The English king, Edward III, said he would accept their surrender if six of their leading citizens, called Burgers, would come to him prepared to die, in rags with ropes around their necks and with the key to the city. So the six citizens came forward, but to their surprise, the English queen had mercy on them, and they were spared. The people of Calais probably expected something that focused on a single noble figure, perhaps in a pyramid shape, like this Chinese statue celebrating the heroism of Chinese workers. The officials of Calais were shocked, however, when Rodin gave them not a heroic statue, but a group of six men all of the same height, all facing in different directions. Here's the Philadelphia version. Rodin began, of course, by making separate statues of each man, and there are authorized versions of the individual men at museums around the world. So let's start by looking at the separate statues. This figure is probably what the good people of Calais expected. He's brave, showing no fear as he walks calmly to his death. Now, let's look at some of the others. Typically of Rodin, they're each powerfully expressive. Here's a very old man, emaciated from the siege, suggesting perhaps that he goes to his death, thinking that he has not long to live. But here's a younger man. We can almost hear him saying, Yes, it's good that you older men are sacrificing yourself, but why me? I have my whole life before me. Another figure has his hand across his face, as though to shield himself from the blows that he expects. Meanwhile, another figure is clearly terrified. He doesn't want to die. Now, come back to the group. The individuals are remarkable, but taken together, they are not a statement of heroism, but a conversation of different perspectives on death. That's Rodin's contribution, to create powerful figures that raise questions and challenge our preconceptions. Images that are expressive and even exaggerated, rather than traditionally beautiful and lifelike. So come to the Rodin anytime. Bring your lunch, sit in the garden, and enjoy some of the world's greatest sculptures. And if you like this video, subscribe to my channel or read the description below for links to my other videos about the great art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art.